Let us pray as we start. Dear God, as we open your word, please open our ears so that we can listen well. And please open our mind so that we can understand. And please give us a hungry heart so that we can receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, so today uh, we are going to think about worship. What is worship? So as we start, I want to ask you a few questions. See if you can help me decide if this is true or false, or if, if you agree or disagree. Okay, so the first statement, okay, do you think worship should make the worshipers feel good? You agree or disagree? True or false? Okay. Second, worship should be entertaining. What do you think? You don't need to answer it. You think about it. Okay. Next, so without music, there's no true worship. Okay, wow, nice. So God accepts people's worship in whatever and uh, whatever, however way they want. Okay. Humans are intelligent beings who can choose not to worship God. Okay, well, we have a consensus. Okay, it's true. Next, worship is our response to God's self-revelation and mercies. You agree? Disagree? Yeah? Okay, not sure. Next, so worship is the believer's way of life and service. Same? Yeah? Okay. God is the focus of our worship. Agree? Yeah, at least we agree in this one, okay? <laughs> Wonderful. So every Sunday we come to church to worship God, right? Now, do we worship God only on Sundays in the church? What does it mean to really worship God? So the theme for today's message is deeper in mercy and further in worship. So. Uh, the Apostle Paul, the passage that we just read. Now, I'm going to use today the NIGTC translation by uh, biblical scholar uh, Richard Longenegger, okay? So we are going to study it with this uh, translation, which is um, more uh, for study. So these verses actually give us a biblical foundation of true worship. It teaches us the why, the what, and the how of worship. First of all, why do we worship God? Okay, so this verse uh, tells us, verse one, that we worship God as our response to God for his mercies. It says, in view of the aforetasted mercies of God. Now we worship because God has given us all the things uh, uh, from his mercy, right? So what are the mercies of God? So these are the gracious gifts of love for salvation that God gives to undeserved sinners like us. So if you read Romans chapter 1 to 11, okay, because we are now in Romans 12, but from chapter 1 to 11, actually the Apostle Paul explains to us what is God's mercy and why we need these mercies of God. So in this um, in this chart, I have tried to summarize, okay? Highlight the main points. I hope you can see a, a little bit, okay? So without God's mercies, what is our human condition? Paul explains that we are unruly and disobedient people. We are powerless and weak to do good. We can't stop doing evil. We are controlled by our untamed desires. We are hurtful and harmful. We are proud and selfish. We are hostile and enemies of God. We are spiritually dead. We are disconnected from anything that has to do with God. 
we're disqualified to be in his presence, we have no hope, no true hope. We can have wish, wish thinking, okay, wishful thinking. We are sentenced and condemned and we are under God's judgment. But God has given us his grace and his mercies. So he brings us to the other side. In God's mercy, people are reconciled to God by Jesus' blood. They are forgiven and have peace with God. We can live under God's grace. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do good. We share in Jesus' resurrected life. We have a new beginning, new life to do the things, to do the right things. We have a new identity. You and I can be children of God. And we have the joy because of our hope in God's glory. And we can have joy even in the middle of suffering. And we are saved from God's judgment. Wow. So my question is, which side do you think distressed you more? You on the mercy, mercy side or without the mercy side? For sure, I was on that terrible side without God's mercy. I remember when I was little, I learned very early that there was one God only, and this God created the whole world. And I heard that God is really good, and he's loving and holy, and that God uh, lives in heaven. His home is heaven, and only perfect people can go there. In contrast, I knew that I was a real sinner. Okay, I was terrible. I was mean, selfish, proud. I was like a land mine full of anger, waiting for a very unfortunate person to bump into me and then explode. Usually, that person was my sister. <laughs> John, you don't know that. Anyways, when I was about nine, nine years old, my parents talked about divorce. I felt that life had no meaning. When I was 10, I thought I'll run away from home when I turned 12. Now, when I turned 12, I realized I had no money. I couldn't run from home. Then I thought I'll run from home when I turned 14. Then, when I was 14, I didn't have money still. And I was empty and miserable. So one night, I thought about God and life. And suddenly, I started talking to God in my heart. And I said, God, if you are real, if there's really a God, I want to know you because life stinks, right? If you exist, God, life should be better. So I want to know you because if you are real and I don't know you, I'm missing out. Life should be much better than this. But if you're not real, that means I'm talking to myself. Then I would rather die earlier because life stinks. You have to study hard. You have to work hard. You have to compete hard. You have to pretend hard. You suffer. You struggle. And then you die, right? So if that's it, all right, I'd rather die earlier. Well, I prayed this way, not sure if there was really a God or if God was listening to me. The next day, I forgot about that prayer. Life went on. But you know what? Actually, God was in that prayer. Two months later, some missionaries visited my mom and my grandmother, and then they invited me to their Bible study. Wow, I found the Bible so amazing. I began to read the Bible every day. Every word was so real. It showed me why I was so empty and miserable. It was all because I was on that wrong side of that chart. I was a messed up sinner. The Bible also explains why our world is so messed up. Every day we hear bad news, right? Every day I turn to my little thing and I want to have some good news. But what I hear is of wars, 
the bullies violently attack their neighbors, the neighboring nation. Why? Because they want to dominate others, because they just want to do it because they can do it. And we hear of floods, we hear of wild fi uh, fires, we hear of diseases, and so uh, and on and on. The reason why we are so messed up is because we humans have walked away from God. And we are selfish, we are proud, we are violent, we cause suffering on other people, destruction and pain. Even God's creation suffers because of us. And yet, God loves this world. He loves you, he loves me. How, how does God love us? He came, he sent his own son to give us a solution. So Romans 5, 5 to 8. So how about if I invite the ladies to read the red and the gentlemen to read the black? Okay, one, two, three. Ladies first. Gentlemen. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, his enemies, Christ died for us. So God was willingly, okay, uh, to sacrifice his only son, Jesus Christ, to free us from our condition. And after freeing us, he has poured his love into our hearts by giving us his holy presence, his Holy Spirit. So God's mercies rescue us from our negative condition and empower us for a new and positive life. This is the greatest gift the world can receive. Why? Because it solves the greatest problem of humanity is our sin. We have no idea of the cost and the magnitude of God's mercies for us. Now, if our heart doesn't swell up with worship to God. For this, maybe it's because we have not really understood what God's mercies are. Or maybe we have not received his mercies yet. Maybe today is a good chance, if you're not sure, to ask God for that mercy into your life. You can talk to Pastor Chris, John, or the leaders. Hope, and they will help you. Now, the deeper we understand God's mercies, the further we will grow in worshiping him. This is why at the end of verse 1, it says, this is your proper act of worship as rational people. It means that as rational beings, humans are the only one who can choose to respond to God's mercy in worship or we can respond to not worship him, but to worship God is the most reasonable and most great, grateful thing we can do. Now, the second thing about uh, these two verses is that worship is offering our body in holy living for God's purposes. We, we read in verse one, it says, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your proper act of worship as rational people. Now, Paul is using Old Testament language, okay? God had prescribed in the, in the um, Old Testament time that people should worship him in certain way, okay? People had to bring holy animal sacrifices to the temple. Holy meant a perfect animal, not sick, not blind, not lame, no defects. And holy meant that it had to be set apart to be killed completely, dedicated for God. They had to follow exactly these requirements for their offering to be acceptable to God. 
they could not just do whatever they wanted, however they wanted. But these Old Testament um, sacrifices were temporary representations of the ultimate sacrifice. Guess what? What is the ultimate sacrifice? We all know, right? Jesus is the perfect, holy, and ultimate acceptable sacrifice. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And because of Jesus' sacrifice, we don't need to offer animal sacrifices for our sins anymore. Rather, we accept Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf and then we offer our worship sacrifices of thanksgiving and service. Now, these three words, living, holy, and acceptable to God, are adjectives that describe how our body sacrifice should be. Okay? First of all, we know that this language is Old Testament metaphor, right? Metaphor for what? Li what is a living sacrifice? It means that we don't kill ourselves, okay? Don't kill yourself. But you live sacrificially for God, right? And secondly, what is a, a holy sacrifice? Now, holy means something dedicated fully for God. So we give our best to God. And we, we are dedicated fully and exclusively for God. For example, we all have things that we use that is only fully dedicated for us, right? Your toothbrush. So you will not, I guess not, share your toothbrush with your siblings or with your dog, and never mind use your toothbrush to scrub the toilet and then brush your teeth. Ew, that was disgusting, right? Well, likewise, our bodies belong to God, okay? Everything we do with our body is supposed to be an act of worship to God and for his purposes. So imagine what happens if you praise God with your mouth and at the same time you speak foul language with it. Or if you read God's word with your eyes and at the same time you watch pornography. Or you cheat at school, you cheat at work, and then you witness about Jesus. You know what? To God, that mixture is disgusting. It's offensive. It's not acceptable. Because God is holy, and his Holy Spirit is in us. We are his temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So can you see why holiness matters in worship? So now Jesus said, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is another metaphor of offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. To deny ourselves, pick up our cross, it means to sacrifice our selfish ambitions, right? To give up our ego. Now, to follow Jesus means to live a holy life, to do um, his word. So these two metaphors of the Old Testament sacrifice and the New Testament cross actually points us to something very important. Can you guess what it is? These two metaphors point us to fulfill the greatest commandment. It is to love God with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our soul, with all our mind and love our neighbor as ourselves, right? So how, so it's actually very simple. Just imagine if those responsible for the war in Ukraine, they decide to die to their selfish ambition and they start loving God and loving their neighbors, how different would our world be, right? So most people think about Sunday singing and sermons when they think about worship. Yes, that's very important because God called us to rest on the Sabbath and come and worship him as a body of Christ and to learn to be fed with his word, right? 
but our worship needs to grow further than Sunday and the church attendance. True worship is offering our body to love God and to love our neighbors in our daily holy living, fulfilling God's purposes and for his glory. Now, let me ask you, is this easy? No, it's very hard. Why? We are full of bad stuff inside, right? So we need major transformation. And this is why the third thing about worship in these two verses is that it says, do not conform to this present age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to discern, to test, and approve God's will, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Now we need an inner transformation of the mind to become people who habitually acts according to God's will, who is able to worship God with our mind. So there's a famous saying, and I'll ask maybe we all read together. How about that? One, two, three. Watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. Watch your character. It becomes your destiny. Well, there's, I think, a lot of wisdom in this um, saying. Do you agree? It all starts with our minds, right? It starts in our mind and with a thought, with an idea. Your thoughts are the seeds for your actions. If you want to change your actions, you need to change your thoughts. Every day, we are bombarded with this information, misinformation, I just call it false information. And the Bible calls it lies, okay? They creep into our thinking, it trickles down to our attitude, and it spills over in our actions. To combat these, um, these lies, okay, what can we do? So Paul tells us, verse two, do not conform to this present age. That's the first thing we need to do. Some translation says, do not conform to this world. Now this age, this world, it means that we must stop following the temporal values of this world that are contrary, incompatible to God's eternal will. First John chapter two, verses 14, uh, 15, 17, a very famous passage, it tells us, do not love this world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And this world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, this world in, or the world in 1 John does not refer to God's uh, great creation, okay? We are to love God's natural creation. But the world in these verses refer to man-made selfish values that dominates our world, such as desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, the desires, these desires, okay, to desire these things is to selfishly pursue fame and power. Disregarding other people is to pursue recognition, to pursue money or material goods, is to pursue sex, sensual gratification at the expense of others. So where do we get all these values from? What do you think? Do we get them from social media? Like TikTok, Instagram, YouTube? How about from friends? If we hang around with people who to speak certain way? How about from movies? Nowadays, there are so many movies. And how about video games or the news? or school, 
or from our family or university or college, even our workplace? What do you think? I think all of the above, right? We find expressions of these values everywhere. Actually, our enemy, the devil, has been using these platforms to cause confusion in the mind. And he started early with the first couple. If you remember what the serpent, what did the serpent say to the woman? Did God really say that you must not eat any of the fruit of any tree? And then he said, no, you will certainly not die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, this has been the devil's tactic from the beginning, to sow doubt in your mind, to give you the wrong ideas, to question God's word and question God's goodness, to make you think that God is oppressive, he's bossy, he's power grabbing, and also to make us think and question our own nature and our own identity. God says that we are the crown of his creation. We are made in his image. But the devil says, no, you can be like God. And if you are like God, you can decide what is right and what is wrong. And if you are like God, you can define who you are. His tactic has not changed much, right? In our world today, we are redefining human nature. We are redefining what's good and what's evil. We are re redefining what's love and so forth. And we have to agree to those definitions or else you'll be labeled a bigot, a hater. Now to combat these lies, we have to not conform to this present age. And secondly, we have to be transformed by renewing our minds, okay? We need a metamorphosis type of inner transformation of the mind, something that will change us from a caterpillar to a beautiful butterfly, to become people who can habitually worship God with our whole being. Now, biblical scholar Logan, um, Longenecker, he described this transformation, it should look like this. He says, it is a complete inner change of thought, of will and desires that Christians are to allow God by means of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to bring about in our lives, resulting in a re recognizable external change of actions and conduct. Now, how can we accomplish that? Paul tells us we have to feed our mind with the correct thoughts of God, correct thoughts of God's work, and correct thoughts of God's word. Correcting also our thoughts about human and correct thoughts of right and wrong. Now, what comes up in your mind when you think about God? We need to, we can examine what do we think when we think about people. Now, Paul, of course, from chapter 12 to 15, he explains a lot of um, things that we can do to change our minds, our thoughts. I'll try to give you, um, sorry, uh, only two examples. One example is in verse three, Romans 12, three, it says, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. Now, in our world, how do people think? In our world, if you are more gifted, okay, if you are more talented, if you have um, more titles, then you are worth more. You feel superior. You have a better chance to climb the ladder, right? And you can be the boss. You can boss people around. You can look down on others. You should be proud. But according to God's word, this is wrong. Why? Because all our talents or our abilities are gifts from God. We didn't do anything to get them. 
okay? Some have more, some have less, but that's okay because these are gifts that God gives us for us to humbly use it to serve others. So the more we have, the more we have to work, okay? So they are not trophies to boost up our pride. Secondly, in 12, 9, verse 12, um, 9, it says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Interesting. God's word says that love must be sincere. Right after love, it says, hate. No, this world, what it says, we don't hate. We only love. Love is a, in this world, okay? Love is subjective good feelings. Love is everything. Love is God. In the name of love, everything goes. This love supports people who do drugs if they want to. This love helps drug addicts. How? Provide them with clean needles and provide them with a safe place so that they can help themselves, so that they don't overdose and die. But according to God, love is holy. God is love, not love is God. I will let you think about the difference. Now, God's love desires the good for the person, but usually people, they don't know what is good and what is evil, and usually people desire evil more than good. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, it says that love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. True love hates evil, because love and truth they go together. Loving someone means that we wish God's good for that person. We might not do everything that that person wants, or we might not agree with the person. Why? Because people often do not know what is good, and they don't want to do what is good. Okay? Therefore, we, Paul says, we need to have an inner transformation of our mind, of our thoughts through God's word, in order that we can discern what is good in God's eyes, what is perfect and pleasing. Then we can truly love God and truly love people. Now, let me conclude with this um, story that I read, a very interesting story. It's about the Inuit people. You know the Inuits, right? They live in very, very cold weather. And they hunt, their lifestyle is uh, hunting, and they need to hunt wolves for fur because Inuit people, they rely on the fur for their clothing to protect them from the extreme cold weather, okay? So there's a tribe of Inuits up in the Arctic, okay, who have learned to set a very simple yet very effective trap to hunt wolves. So maybe you know this story, okay? So first, they will sharpen a knife, okay? They will sharpen it so well that it's razor sharp. Then they will dip the knife, um, the sharp end, right, into the uh, seal's blood, like um, they hunt seals for their food and then they take the blood. And then they would dip the knife, uh, the sharp edge to the blood and then they would take it outside and let it freeze, it freezes so quickly and then come back and dip again, and then go out and freeze this again. So back and forth, back and forth, until they get a real nice uh, blood sickle. Okay, it's a blood sickle that you have the knife uh, blade inside like a, a popsicle stick, okay? And you don't get to see the, 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 well. So that's the end of, result, right? So you have a nice um, blood sickle and it hides the blade of the, of the knife. So after it's well done, they will take it out and then they will uh, put it in the wilderness where they know that the walls are around, okay? They bury the handle 
inside the snow, leaving the blood sickle up, standing up. And then they go home. So now, after a while, a wolf will come along, guided by the scent of the blood. And he will begin, wow, dinner. So he'll begin licking it, licking the blood. So that's what wolves eat, okay? So enjoying every taste, over and over, he licks the knife, and soon his tongue is so cold, he cannot feel it any longer. His tongue is numb, but he stays for blood is growing. And finally, his licking exposes the razor-sharp knife. It cuts into his tongue again and again, but he does not even notice it for his tongue cannot longer feel anything. It's numb. So the wolf's own blood now flows from his tongue, and then the wolf is thrilled with a taste of fresh blood, plentiful and warm. He continues to lick more and more his own blood. Soon he gets weak, and within minutes he collapses. Next to the naked knife. His last thought were, wow, how good the warm blood tasted. So the next morning, the Inuit goes out. He knows he will find the wolf's body right beside the knife. Now, we understand that this is the cycle of life in nature, right? But you know what? Especially if we think people are like wolves, are, are like that wolf. We are oblivious of the danger, attracted by the thrill of the taste of gratifying our desires, right? We are feeding our minds with the deadly popsicles or bloodsicles of the worldly values. The more we consume, the more numb and desensitized we become from God's word. The result is the people, they bleed to death spiritually. They fall into the trap of these worldly values, right? Isn't that what happened to Adam and Eve? Remember? They saw that the fruit was good and desirable to be wise and to know good and evil and be like God. And then what did they do? They took it. So this is why God says, do not conform to this world. Be transformed. Why? Because God desires good for us. So God sent his son. In contrast, Jesus said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus came and he bled to death so that we can have renewed lives and truly worship God. So the question is, what are we feeding our minds with? Are we aware of the blood sickles that is attracting us, luring us, so let me encourage you to commit every day to spend time in God's presence. Is it doable? I will ask you to make a commitment to spend time in God's presence. Allow his word to feed your mind. It all starts there. Okay. So we need an inner transformation of the mind to become people who can habitually and continuously worship God according to his will. <clears throat> worship begins in our mind. Okay, so the Apostle Paul says, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of the aforetasted mercies of God to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your proper act of worship as rational people. Do not conform to this present age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to 
test and approve what God's will is. That is his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Okay. So worship is our response to God's mercies. Worship is offering our body in holy living for God's purposes. And worship requires inner transformation by the renewal of our mind. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you send your hope, your son Jesus Christ into this world so that we don't need to bleed to die, but you bled to give us new life. Dear God, thank you. Lord, help us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, to live holy lives acceptable to you, to know how to love you and to, to love our neighbors according to your will. And dear God, help us to be, um, to be on guard of the influences of this world and help us to choose to spend time with you and allow your word to renew our minds. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.